I think one of the things that is always underestimated when we talk about co when we talk about the cost of cancer mm -hmm. is really the cost of what happens to you and what you lose and the opportunities that you lose both you and and one's family and I think that that's why the um, title of your series life interrupted was so evocative and it is um, there is an incredible interruption and an incredible cost to all of that. But um, there, I think that people really underestimate that. And I think if we're really looking at holistically how we integrate these conversations, we can't just think about what we end up in debt for in terms of our medical costs. It's also the cost of daily mm -hmm. living. Yeah, I think you know, young adults have always been an especially vulnerable patient population on a number of levels. They're one of the few patient demographic groups whose survival and cure rates have not improved in the last few decades, unlike adult patients and pediatric patients. Um, and before the Affordable Care Act, they were also the largest uninsured population in the country because you know, youth and health are supposed to go hand in hand. The thing that you're probably not going to invest in unless you've been sick before is your health insurance and you're going to get the cheapest plan if you get a plan at all. Yes. You know, when you talk about the cost of care, you also have to look at where a patient is starting from. And so uh, when I entered the hospital to begin chemotherapy, um, I didn't relate to my roommate in the hospital that first week, uh, who was 65 years old and who was retired and had children. I was still figuring out all of those things. I didn't have a family of my own. Um, I didn't have a savings account. I didn't have a retirement plan or much of a plan at all for that matter. The impact on your family and the impact on your mother, because we often we we think about the financial costs and the sacrifice. Often we focus very much on the patient, but this was a family sacrifice. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it doesn't matter how many fancy degrees you hold or how educated you might be when you're really sick and you're on a lot of morphine you're not in a position <laughs> to advocate for yourself, let alone to go through piles of paperwork. And so I thought about that a lot um, because, you know, there were so many things uh, that were over my head and you can't underestimate the overwhelm factor for patients when they receive a cancer diagnosis. Um, my first stint in the hospital, I spent two months inpatient in isolation. And even though the hospital was in network, it turned out that not all of the doctors who worked there were in network. And so on any given day, I would have some days up to 30 different people coming into my room. I'd have a palliative care team. I'd have a psycho-oncologist. I'd have the attending doctors. And what we didn't know then, uh, but we quickly learned when I was released from the hospital, was that we got you know, a stack this high of bills uh, from doctors who are not in network. Uh, and what do you do with that as a patient? Do you put up a sign on your hospital room door? Do you, as a patient who's in excruciating pain, you know, stop the palliative care team and say, uh, excuse me, before you give me my morphine, uh, are you in network? Um, no, of course not, right? You're, totally overwhelmed and you're suffering and you need treatment. Uh, and without my mom, who managed to spend, I mean, hundreds of hours dis disputing each, every individual claim uh, that we got uh, like that, I would have been who knows how much in debt. Uh, but I know for certain that I wouldn't have had the energy or the wherewithal to dispute all of those claims. And that's just a small example among many of the ways in which having a full-time caregiver when you're really sick isn't just helpful, uh, but, but necessary. One of the first things that I learned um, as I was 
not only wrapping my head around the diagnosis, but around this infertility piece, is that before even I began chemotherapy, I had to decide if I was going to take the time to go through fertility preservation options. And once I decided that that was something that was important to me, uh, I then learned that um, the fertility preservation treatments, which can cost you know, 20, upwards to $20,000, were not covered by my insurance. And the reason they weren't covered was because I technically wasn't infertile yet, even though I would be in about a month. Um, and so it was considered an elective procedure. And so I was lucky, uh, thanks to my nursing team and to an incredible social worker, to get a grant uh, through an organization called Fertile Hope. Mm -hmm. uh, and they wrote a check, and they offset a huge amount of that cost. But I know of so many young adult patients who, before they've even begun to wrap their head around things like chemotherapy or radiation or surgery or whatever it may be, have to make a decision that hugely impacts their future um, that's a financial one. But when you think about outcomes and when you think about mental health and mindset going into treatment, these are all the things that even before you begin um, as a patient, you're trying to hold into your head, in your head, and you're trying to make sense of. Um, and it's a lot, and it's, it's really hard, uh, especially for the many patients who don't have uh, parents who are able to take time off of work or to be their caregivers.